Episode 167 of the Read to Lead podcast is brought to you by cloud accounting software FreshBooks with a free 30-day unrestricted trial for you. To claim it, go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. Nothing is less important in the construction of your life than a feeling. And and yet we live in a society who has now become obsessed with how people feel. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now here's Jeff. Well, if you're looking for the podcast dedicated to your personal and professional growth, you have found it. We talk, of course, about leadership, dig into that just about every week. And also topics like personal growth, productivity, career, business, marketing, sales, and entrepreneurship, and it's personal growth, getting the emphasis today. In a moment, you and I are going to be joined by Andy Andrews. He's the author of several New York Times best-selling books, and his latest is called The Little Things, Why You Really Should Sweat the Small Stuff. I'll be asking Andy why he believes not sweating the small stuff is actually unproductive, I'll quiz him about the difference between perception and perspective and why you must understand the distinction. We'll dig into the myths we associate with change and the ingredients necessary for true change to occur and quite a bit more. If the ratings and reviews of the Read to Lead podcast that we're fortunate to see in iTunes and elsewhere are any indication, a lot of folks are being helped and impacted by the Read to Lead podcast. If that happens to be you, one of the ways you can return the favor, if you will, is to check out that free trial from our sponsor, FreshBooks Cloud Accounting Software. There's absolutely no obligation to do so. You may know that I've been using FreshBooks Cloud Accounting Software for about eight years, since about 2000. And I am in love with the all new version of FreshBooks, the new dashboard. I'm looking at mine right now. I've got quick access to outstanding revenue. I can see my total profit for the year. My spending and where money is going is right there on my dashboard, plus access to advanced reports like profit and loss, accounts aging, invoice details, expense reports, you name it. FreshBooks does it all, and it makes it so easy if you're running a business or you're a freelancer and you need to invoice clients. I love it, and so do many Read to Lead podcast listeners who have already started using it since FreshBooks became a sponsor about a year ago. If you want to take advantage of that free 30-day unrestricted trial, all you have to do is go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash read to lead. Andy Andrews is a best-selling novelist, speaker, and consultant for some of the world's most successful teams, largest corporations, and fastest-growing organizations. He also personally coaches individuals and small business owners to become unshakable entrepreneurs at andyandrews.com. Andy, as you may know, is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The Noticer, and the modern classic, The Traveler's Gift, among others. And he also has a podcast of his own. It's called In the Loop with Andy Andrews. And you may recall he first appeared on Read to Lead back in 2013 for an early episode, episode 14. And we talked about his book, The Noticer Returns. His latest book and the one we'll focus on today is out now and is called The Little Things, Why You Really Should Sweat the Small Stuff. Andy, so glad to have you back. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast once again. Buddy, thank you. I'm honored to be here. And gosh, you're having me back. You're a glutton for punch. <laughs> well, I had so much fun the first time. I, I knew one day we'd get around to, to having you back on. And... <laughs> well, good, good. I'm glad. <laughs> well, Andy pulls no punches. Uh, very early in the book, he starts right off with, with saying that the big problem with not sweating the small stuff is, and I quote, a decidedly unproductive approach to virtually everything in your life you consider important. So the question for you is, why do you feel so strongly about that? I I look at, first of all, at, at results. You know, mm. I'm not a celebrity. I, I don't have, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't have a, a gold medal. I don't have Super Bowl rings. You know, mm. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. And so in my life, I can't show up somewhere and 
everybody be satisfied just to take their picture with me. Okay, <laughs> uh, I actually have to produce results. Mm. And so when I started looking at how these results were produced, and I started realizing that I cannot have just normal results. See, normal results with a company is they're going to increase 15, 20, 22 percent a year, year after year after year. That's if they're in first or second or third place. You know, but I knew that I had to have I had to have people doubling and tripling mm. what they were doing. And I knew that would not be done doing what they were already doing or doing what everybody was doing. So I, as I started looking, I started being suspicious about anything that was conventional wisdom. And and one of the, the biggest parts of conventional wisdom is don't sweat the small stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and if you look at uh, corporate America or you look at uh, small businesses or teams, everybody's after somebody with a big picture. We want somebody with a big picture. Well, they have the big picture. We want to promote people that have the big picture. We want to hire people that have the big picture. Well, Jeff, you and I know that a lot of times people who have the big picture, mm-hmm. uh, they can talk, they can, they look good, but, but sometimes they're not aware of all the little details that have to be done for that big picture to come together. Mm-hmm. And and so the thing that occurred to me is that every big picture that is ever completed is made up of little bitty things. You know, if you look at, at, at the Mona Lisa, uh, when, when the Mona Lisa was created, da Vinci chose the smallest brush that anybody could use to paint that it was the tiniest little brush and even his peers said what are you doing you know you got to sell this stuff it's going to take you forever to do this and he said i'm creating a masterpiece well i mean he he went into it intending to create a masterpiece and and if you if you look at what happened well he did you know 500 years later we can go to the louvre and we can look at the mona lisa and it, but but if even if you look at it through a magnifying glass you cannot see individual brush strokes it is mm. of photographic quality even though it was done 500 years ago he created a masterpiece and so the point i suppose is that you're creating something with your life, with your business, with your family, and and at the end of it all, whether you have created a masterpiece or a disaster, <laughs> it will have been done one moment at a time, one choice at a time, one tiny brushstroke at a time. Mm. Uh, something uh, pretty prevalent, Andy, in our society today is is everybody's offended about something. It seems, and and you say in the book that the wise among us are being marginalized. I think is the word you use, and, and it's our own fault. Uh, why? Why do you say that? It is our own fault because wise people they they tend to observe before they speak, and so when when you're sometimes when you're faced with people who speak before they think, uh, <laughs> you know, and you've got a lot of people who are used to it, they can push the wise people into the ditch, and nobody ever notices that they're running right over them. You see, here here's the thing, the offense thing. It's a feeling. That's all it is, is a feeling. And nothing is less important in the construction of your life than a feeling. You know, we and and yet we live in a society who has now become obsessed with how people feel. It is a dangerous lie that we are telling our kids, that we're telling people who are looking for work, that we're telling people who want to better themselves. It's a dangerous lie. Since you were a little kid, not a single good thing has ever ever happened to you uh, based on how you felt. If you look at our economy, our system of relationships, it, it doesn't have anything to do with how you feel. It's how you act. It's what you do. And it's always been that way. From the time you were a little kid, every girl who who liked you, uh, it didn't have anything to do with how you felt. You know, it, from the time you were a little kid, every teacher who gave you the benefit of the doubt, every coach who said, you're starting. On Friday night, uh, it, it had to do with with uh, with what you did. I mean, did your parents ever say, "Gosh, we can't punish Jeff anymore"? It just makes him feel, <laughs> you know. I'm, I mean, did your teachers say, "Well, we can't give Jeff C's anymore because, mm-hmm. gosh, they make him feel bad"? I guess we're just going to have to give him A so he'll feel better. And then when you became an adult, has anybody ever interviewed for a job and had somebody say, "I tell you what, uh, if I give you the job, how are you going to feel?" <laughs> 
I mean, nobody cares. Right. Nobody <laughs> cares. It's why we think that uh, manners are important with children. And, and kind of across the board, we kind of all somewhat agree. But we don't really agree on how many manners or what kind of manners and all like that. And the reason is because nobody really stops to think about why manners are important. And the reason manners are important is because this child will be faced with a world where feelings do not matter and actions do. And if you stop and think about it, we all know that a five-year-old who turns into an adult with excellent manners has many more opportunities, financial and otherwise, than a five-year-old who turns into an adult with average or below average manners. Mm. Uh, you remind me of a story uh, that is shared later in the book of, of the father uh, attempting to instill a modicum of, of respect in his teenage son. I, I took a picture. I hope this is OK. I took I took a picture of, <laughs> of four of the pages uh, you telling that story. And I texted them to my sister, who has a 13 year old son. Uh, he's coming with us to stay for a week uh, later this summer. And she's asking if she can go ahead and send him now. because <laughs> 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 been some issues there. She she loved it. Um, w- would you be willing to share a uh, a principle or a life lesson you learned, Andy, back when you were uh, just a wee lad, about 20 years old, and realized, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm on the ocean and I'm lost. Yeah, man, that was a crazy, that was a crazy day. I love to fish and I've always loved to fish. And, uh, you know, living on the coast, we would, we would look at, at the Gulf and we go, well, it's not that rough. That's <laughs> not that rough. You know, we can handle that. And so we had heard that the tuna were just killing it mm-hmm. about a hundred miles out on one of the oil rigs. And, you know, we had no business going out with a single engine boat with a boat that that was that small but we you know we were young we were stupid <laughs> and we, we we only had enough gas to get there fish you know to like to hook up to the rig and fish and then get back I and mean, we didn't have enough even to troll around or to to wander around but we would go out in the afternoon the mid afternoon it was about a 4 hour trip and it would get dark as we were going because we were going to fish out there at night. You know, the it's just like in a pond. If if you if you look at a pond, you want to fish in the pond. Well, you look where where did the tree fall in the pond? That's where you want to fish. You want to fish around the tree. Well, the Gulf of Mexico or the ocean, they're deserts. Okay, and so when somebody puts an oil rig out there, the fish come to it and and its structure. And and then at night. This thing is lit up like God's last bonfire, and and so fish come up around that. So you fish, you can catch a lot of fish. So we we would arrive in the dark, and so as we're getting out there, you start to see this oil rig lit up over the horizon. So as we left, you know, we set the autopilot uh, on the on the the machines on the gadgetry, and and uh, and we left Orange Beach, Alabama. And as we kind of looked behind us for three, four, five, seven miles. It all looked the same to us. I mean, you know, the same stuff's disappearing in our rearview mirror, so to speak. And 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 yet we get to go on for a couple of hours, three hours, and th- and then in about four hours, you know, we're kind of looking at each other. It's dark already, and we're going, shouldn't we have seen the rig by now? Mm. I mean, shouldn't we? <laughs> and now we're we're a little nervous. And and after a while, we we decide we should have definitely seen this rig by now, and we realize that we must have somehow missed it. And now we got to turn around. We're going to have to turn around, go back, because we haven't got enough gas to look for it. We're not even sure we have enough gas to get back. And we did not. And we floated for a long time when we ran out. And obviously, you know, we got back because we're sitting here talking, okay? But the point is that uh, a week later, my friend's father had that all that machinery surveyed and the autopilot was off by two degrees. Now there are 360 degrees on a compass, which runs an autopilot, you know, two degrees, it's nothing. It's a 16th of an inch on a compass. And, Mm -hmm. and you get, you know, 10 miles out, you can't tell any difference really when you're looking back, but if you're heading for a specific spot, a hundred miles out, when you go a hundred miles, you are miles away from where you intended. Mm. And so we had literally missed it. We weren't even on the same horizon. <laughs> and and so number one, I mean the obvious lesson it taught me is to make sure the electronics are working correct. <laughs> but but in a longer scope, it really taught me that people think 
that to end up in a different place or to have different things happen in their life, that they have to make drastic changes. Okay, but but if if a little bitty deviation down the road can you can end up in a in a in a different place than you intended by far, then a little deviation at the beginning can also have you end up in a different place that you intend. And so even at the beginning of journeys, don't be afraid to make little shifts and understand that those are going to have great, great consequences down the road. Mm. Uh, you talked about uh, change, Andy. What are, what are some of the, the myths we associate with, with change and maybe the ingredients uh, necessary for, for, for true change to occur in the first place? This is a critical thing. And and in fact, in the book, that's chapter 13, and that's where your sister uh, was reading that (laughs) about about her son. Mm. This may be one, it may be the most important thing that I I have kind of figured out Mm. or or whatever, or the most impactful thing. Have you ever done something for a while and you, you just weren't getting the results you wanted and then you stopped and you maybe hired a consultant or you you formed a committee and you looked and you know you kind of go well I just yeah I guess we just need to work harder I guess we need to come in early I guess we just need to keep doing this longer but then it never really worked and and then years later you found out gosh I didn't I didn't know the truth. You know, they lied to me or I was uh, misinformed or I misunderstood or for whatever reason, you didn't really know the truth. And because you didn't know really the truth, you could have worked forever. And it was never going to happen because what you were doing was based on something that wasn't even true. Well, it occurred to me a few years ago that as a speaker that for years and years I'd gone into companies and organizations and, and, you know, I say, well, what, you know, what do you want to deal with? What do you want to talk about? And over and over people say, well, change, you know, we're having a uh, a time, a time of change now, or well, the government says we are new regulations. We're changing. Well, you know, we're about to initiate a change. Well, we got some people who need to navigate a change. Well, you know, and I mean, just, just all about change. And then I'd come back two years later and they'd want me to talk about the same thing. And I talked about the same thing everybody else talked about, and yet I don't think it was effective. (laughs) And so it drove me crazy, Mm. and I I began to ask some questions. And, you know, I I really believe the quality of your answers in life will be determined by the quality of your questions. Uh, And most people ask bad questions, and so the questions they ask themselves, no matter whether they're good or bad, your subconscious goes to work answering those questions, and so if you can if you can form good questions, your subconscious go to work, you know, on those. Well, I finally came to the conclusion, as a long story short, came to the conclusion that there were three things that everybody believed about change. And these three things were three things that our entire society based uh, initiating changes, navigating changes. I mean, they, they based every change on it. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that change is the constant in our lives. <laughs> it's more of an imposition than most people think. Mm-hmm. Because when you think about how your life changed, well, okay, so you're getting married. Great, great. Well, things are going to change. Ah, oh, you're married. Things changed, didn't they? Oh, so <laughs> something's wrong with your marriage? Oh, things changed again. You want it to be better? Well, things have got to change. I, I mean, it's just, it's <laughs> it's a constant thing. Oh, so you're, you're 13-year-old's not behaving. Well, he used to behave. And so, so things changed. So he's not behaving like you want him to. Okay, well, things got to change. Oh, so you want him to behave not just while you're in front of him, but but you want him to behave all the time. Oh, well, things really have to change. <laughs> and and so it's such a huge thing that, that these three myths have just taken over the landscape. And here's what they are. Number one, change takes time. Mm. Okay, that change is a process. It just takes time. And, but but that's not true. Change happens. In a heartbeat, it may take time to prepare to change. It may take time to get mad enough that you think about preparing to change. (laughs) It may, it may, there's a lot of things that take time. But when change occurs, change happens in a heartbeat. Mm. The second thing is people believe that, that, well, you know, if they're going to change, they got to have a desire to change. In fact, they probably need a deep desire to change it because, you know, if they don't want to change, they're just not going to change. Well, that's not true either. And we know that's not true 
Because you and I could spend a few minutes together and come up with many different examples of times in our lives when we were fine. We're bopping merrily along, and all of a sudden, some new information came in, and and we thought for a second, we went, really? (laughs) And then we did a 180 and never looked back over our shoulder. It, It happened in a heartbeat, and we didn't have a desire to change. We didn't even know change was on the horizon. And all of a sudden, boom, there it is, and we changed. <laughs> and, you know, never, you never thought about whether you wanted it or not, or, you know, never had to dig in with a deep desire. And the third one is this uh, this uh, rock bottom thing that people talk about. Well, you know, they if they're going to change, they're just going to have to hit rock bottom. And they, you know, they haven't hit rock bottom yet. I mean, they thought they were. And we, we thought. <laughs> They probably thought they were, but they they obviously weren't because until they – see, that's not true either because how many times have you and I run into somebody – we've seen this happen over and over again. You know, somebody, they're in rehab, they're out of rehab, they're in rehab, they're out of rehab, and finally their family says, hey, we can't do this anymore. We, and we can't afford it. You know, you're just going to have to figure out something. And so then we don't see them for a few years, and then we run into them, and they're fine. They're married. Everything's fine. They've got a job. They're good. And you go, hey, uh, can I ask you something? What? Man, you're you're looking great. Things things seem to be going. What happened? And they said, well, you know, I, I, I talked to this guy one day, and he said, or, you know, I watched this television program, and this – and I heard this lady say, or, you know, I read this book and there, there was this one paragraph and, 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 and you know, I, I went home and I poured it all down the sink and I never, mm-hmm. I never wanted any, any, anymore. And, you know, we're sitting there going, really, <laughs> really? After all you put us through, somebody said something and you went, I, <laughs> but that's true. It happens. Right. And so obviously they weren't at the rock bottom. And so what happens if those are the three basic beliefs everybody has and none of them are true? Here's what here's what the deal is. There are two things that I cannot find any, not a single example of of true and lasting change. I mean, I'm not organizationally, mm-hmm. not in a state not with with a nation, not with a company or a team or individually. I cannot find a single instance of true and lasting change that these two things do not coexist. Number one, what's in it for me? Mm. Now I'm not I'm not saying this in like a, a greedy way. I'm just saying think human nature. You know, okay, uh, we've been doing it this way for a while, and now you want us to do it this way. Okay, well if we do it this way, what? You know, what happens to us? And and whether they say it to you or not, they're thinking it, okay? Mm -hmm. This, by the way, you know, dealing with a teenager, dealing with a child, this, by the way, is why because I said so does not matter. It it don't work. That's why because I am your father and you will respect me, see, there's nothing in it for the kid. I mean, what's in it for him? I mean, as long as you are in my house, look, they're smart. They know you're bigger than they are. They know you have all the money. And they you can make them behave while they're in front of you. But trust me, in the back of their mind, all they're thinking is, okay, I'm not always going to be in your house. And so if you want a true and lasting change, the number one thing that has to be there for all of us is is value. What? You know, how does this affect me? What's in it for me? And the second thing is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, I'm not saying a mathematical proof. Mm. I'm saying the kind of proof where somebody hears something they never heard, or they hear it in a way they had never heard it before, and they have this kind of reaction, Jeff. They kind of go, huh, I, well, wow, I, ne- I never thought of that before. Wow, that makes, that makes perfect sense. Mm. Gosh, I don't think I'll ever think of it any other way again. And see, here's the deal. When proof beyond a reasonable doubt, when that it just makes perfect sense, when that collides with what's in it for me, Mm. people will change and never look back. I I want you to understand how important that is because I I want you to understand how you can use it, okay? Mm. Because if you are looking for a change in your own life, those things must be present. You must figure out how to align those things in your own life. If you are wanting a curved driveway (laughs) and your wife is wanting a straight driveway, if you really want to come out with a curved one, you better figure out 
what's in it for her if it's curved and it has to make sense to uh, you, you see what i'm saying mm-hmm. and the other thing is in in a business sense or dealing with anybody if you're going to sell something okay well right now they don't buy it you want them to buy it that means they have to change here right now they're not voting for you if you want them to vote for you that means things have to change and so so if things have to change and you want them to vote for you, then they better understand what's in it for them if they do and have proof beyond a reasonable doubt that this is so. Andy says that that our perception and our perspective about something uh, should never or almost never uh, be the same. What do you what do you mean by that exactly? Well, you know, somebody's somebody's perception is what is. Okay, if I if I go into this room and my perception is that this room is uh, cold, well, it probably is cold. <laughs> okay, but my perspective about that can be a totally different thing. Mm-hmm. See, perception is what is. Your perspective about what is shapes the future. Mm-hmm. And, and so let me let me unpack that really quickly. You know, when people talk about somebody's perspective, usually they they say, well, you know, their perspective that that's like how they see a thing. You know, they're they're seeing, you know, whether the glass is half full or half empty. That's that's how they see it. That's their perspective. And people have their own perspective. Well, that's true. But you got to remember, perspective is the only thing that can totally change the results without changing a single fact. It's because the glass, people forget, the glass is what it is. Those, those facts do not change. Right. And yet we all know that if somebody's perspective is that that glass is half empty, well, that person is a little more negative. They're, you know, they're, they're probably not the most fun to be around, and they're probably less likely to be promoted. They're a little less likely to be hired. You know, people don't really want to be around that kind of person that much, and so they don't get the opportunities that other people do. And so their life gets set on a trajectory because of that perspective. Now, a person who has the perspective that that glass is half full, well, that person you know, we tend to hire those kind of people. We tend to promote those kind of people. We, you know, we say, well, you know, we need somebody to lead this team that's really a glass half full kind of person. We need somebody <laughs> like that. And we all enjoy being around those kind of people. And so since we enjoy being around those kind of people, those kind of people have more people around them. Mm-hmm. And when there are ideas to be shared and opportunities to be given, because those people have more people around them, they hear more opportunities, they hear more ideas, and their life is on a different trajectory. And so, the the perspective changes the results, even though the facts stay the same. Now, here is a very cool key, and that is that everybody believes that your perspective is how you see a thing. Uh, that's true, but it's not the total truth, because it is true that perspective is how you see a thing. But the truth is, it's how you choose to see a thing. Mm. You can actually choose your perspective. You don't just walk out there and you just are how you are. I mean, you can choose your perspective. You know, I can walk in this room and my perception is this room is cold. And so my perspective can be, well, it's just too cold for me. I don't know if I can stay in here. You know, I can't even concentrate if it's so cold. I wish I had brought a sweater. Can anybody turn this down? I mean, how do people even work in here and it's so cold? I can't believe or or my perspective can be, Woo, man, it's a little brisk in here. I bet I won't be going to sleep when I'm trying to work at the computer today. I bet you I'll be I mean, man, I might, I might get a sweater or something, but this this is pretty amazing. Don't even have to worry about the air conditioner. Da, 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 da. I mean, see, it's it's you choose it. You choose it. Oh uh, wow, well, this is I mean, I could talk about this all day, Andy. I I, I have a, a couple of questions for you, not directly related to the book. You obviously uh, do uh, your fair share of of presentations and public speaking. You travel all over the world. I would love it if you could take a moment. To to share maybe a, a tip or two, a strategy or two for delivering an impactful and, and memorable public talk. Okay. All right. I can definitely tell you that. And it'll go <laughs> right along with what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Now, 
I could have told you a bunch of things a number of years ago. And there are, you know, a lot of little, you know, little curves and cracks, the things that you can go after. But if you want to deliver a memorable and impactful public talk, there are two things that you want to make happen with that crowd. Mm. You want to deliver value to them. You want to you want to deliver something what's in it for them, and you want to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Hmm. You want your audience to walk away changed. I love it. Right from the book. Perfect. Right from the book. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll wrap, uh, Andy, by asking uh, what's next for you. What are you, you and your uh, your team working on now that that you're excited about? You know, I I'm having a a great time uh, working with. Uh, with entrepreneurs on our website, mm-hmm. having just a great time. That was probably the most fun thing that I'm I'm doing right now. I'm always writing, always doing something with my boys. My wife and I have a 14 year old and a 17 year old, and we're just having a, a great time with them. Mm-hmm. And so, just always learning, always working, and um, we love pe- people to join us. AndyAndrews.com. The podcasts are free. Mine's not as good as yours, but it's you know, <laughs> it's, it's fun. So <laughs> I find that a little hard to believe, but <laughs> I appreciate the the compliment. Well, the book again is uh, The Little Things Why You Really Should Sweat the Small Stuff. His name is Andy Andrews. And uh, Andy, we are so thankful for you to uh, come back, especially after having already been here the first time. Uh, a lot of times I ask people back a second time, and they just say no. So I appreciate you saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, buddy, thank you. I appreciate that. We're lucky to have you and appreciate all you bring to us and uh this this is an awesome podcast and i appreciate your your listeners as well so thank you for having me in just a moment andy and i are going to have a bit of a private chat as i pose to him questions that have been submitted by members of the read to lead university book club that's just one of the many perks of being a member of Read to Lead University. In fact, there are some registration spots open right now. If you want to take advantage of one of those and snag them before they're gone, visit readtoleaduniversity.com. That's readtoleaduniversity.com. I want to say a special thanks to me, 15463. You got to love these iTunes usernames, right? Who says Read to Lead has the most inspiring authors on iTunes and gives us a five star rating. You know, we have 306 star ratings, and of those 306, 294 are five star ratings. Thank you so very much. If you'd like to rate and review the podcast and you have an Apple ID, you can go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes. Remember, FreshBooks Cloud Accounting Software has a free 30-day unrestricted trial waiting just for you. FreshBooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. I am so glad to be bringing you this show now for nearly four years and am thankful to you for listening each and every time out. Well, that does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you again next time for the next episode of the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read to Lead.